Hello, everyone. Today, I would like to introduce you the uh, integrated lithium ion based electro optic platform, which we believe is an emerging high speed and a power efficient photonic integrated circuit solution uh, for next generation uh, uh, photonic needs. So, my name is Mian Zhang, and I'm the co founder and CEO of Hyperlex Corporation. Uh, just a quick introduction of the company. Um, so, so Hyperlite is funded in Cambridge, Massachusetts in early 2018, spinning out of Harvard. And uh, we are supported in the beginning uh, by a local VC fund. And we started to ship early prototype devices in early 2019. And then at the same time, we worked on wafer scale production of thin film lithium nanobate wafers and uh, also next generation technologies for even better performances. Uh, during the uh, uh, during the last few years, and more recently, we have worked with our partners to 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 demonstrate uh, applications of synthetic lithium chips and setting a, a couple of records uh, in the uh, in the last few months. So so what Hyperlite is offering is rapid prototype and volume production capability for synthetic for synthetic lithium uh, chips and technologies, uh, and we enable our customers to get very very high performances and uh, uh, we're positioned to serve our customers globally. Um, so the, the problem or the demand we're trying to, uh, to, uh, to target is, is really to, to solve this need of performance and cost effectiveness for next generation photonic integrated circuits. So the, here are a few um, examples of, of where, where such a combination is needed. So for example, for 5G, and the millimeter wave communications, especially the analog side, the extended analog frequency range can range anywhere between tens of gigahertz and up to 300 gigahertz. So there, a low voltage and high bandwidth modulator would be really, really uh, helpful. For new applications such as quantum LiDAR, uh, AR, VR, and also sensor applications, the demand for low loss, low static switching power, uh, but with also extended wavelength range and sometimes gigahertz speed, uh, this special combination can enable a lot of new applications, but these are not accessible with silicon because of the limited transparency range. And looking at the more established uh, uh, markets, for example, for Metro and Telecom uh, and Datacom, the speed of these systems are going faster and faster. And uh, we already know the coherent system will go beyond 130 gigabyte. And then for Datacom, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the next generation would go to 224 gigabits per second 30s, which would require the optics to be able to go over 100 gigabyte as well. So if if we take a closer look of the uh, of the you know for example the the established market, uh, we see that there's uh, this this demand is not just temporary and it will continue to increase over the next few years. And this is largely driven by applications such as in uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and and Internet of Things. So to, to the, the most important thing, I think, going forward to, um, for example, for the data communication is, is really addressing the power efficiency problem, but at the same time, uh, also, also uh, being cost effective. So, so that's really the challenge uh, for the next generation high-speed modules. Um, now, with this in mind, if we look at the available optical engine uh, material choices today, uh, so, so we can put that into this uh, three axis, which I think has been used a lot of times, and I think it's a great way to visualize the way that we could increase bandwidth. Um, so it's pretty much three axes to scale the data rate. Uh, the, the horizontal axis is the bandwidth, so basically how fast or how much symbol rate you can drive. The vertical axis is, is how many bits you can encode in a symbol, and then the, the last axis is how many channels. And then this channel can be increased in either uh, wavelength division multiplexing through a same waveguide, or it could be a parallel waveguide or a combination of those. Um, so, no, so we can try to put uh, existing uh, solutions into the three axis. So if we put the say bulk lithium so we see that bulk lithium is actually performing quite well in terms of speed and also in terms of encoding complexity because of the good linearity. But what is limiting for bulk lithium is its scalability. And for both cost reasons and manufacturing reasons because of relatively large uh, device footprint. Um, so this probably explains why indium phosphide, you know, especially in the last few years, has been really taking over bulk lithium now, but especially in the coherent long distance uh, market, uh, is because indium phosphide can do as good, if not better, 
in both of these uh, data data uh, rate and uh, data modulation symbol rate and then data uh, encoding in, in, in compared to leaking now, but at the same time, it's just much better scalability due to the smaller size. Um, although for indium phosphide, the yield is still a challenge and the uh, the requirements, uh, and then most of the time, it does require thermal electric cooling, which which may pose a challenge for energy efficiency or or, or cost for future systems. But nevertheless, it's still much better than, than bulk uh, lithium Um So because perhaps of the shortage of this tool platform, this is where silicon solutions is really comes in. So if we look at the silicon, um, the part that Silicon Excel said is this multi uh, multi multiple channel, a wide parallel approach where you can, you can put more wavelengths uh, or, or more channels just by simply integrating more components. But what Silicon is suffering is the device performance. So if we compare the Silicon with, for example, in a phosphate or bulk lithium orbit, it's actually the speed that you can drive, at least in a public published domain, it's much, much lower than uh, what has been achieved on NFOS and bulk lithium ion, even after decades of development. Um, and then the encoding also, it's, it's, it suffers compared with this two because of the less linearity and the more absorption loss. So um, considering this, um, so, so, um, it's, so, so, so the solution here is present a, a non-ideal combination, of course, uh, which one to use, whether it's wide parallel or, or single with high speed, this is still a complicated discussion. And it's dependent on you know, a, a, a lot of factors that's, that's, that's beyond uh, just the, uh, the transmitter devices. But I think the more, you know, if you look at the history, uh, it's, it's normally a combination of the three axes with the least amount of effort. So for example, to reach a certain speed, you probably want a good combination of high enough symbol rate uh, with the reasonable channel number plus a reasonable encoding level to really get to a decent speed. So, um, so now from the photonics interview platform, I think the more uh, degree of freedom that, that you would be able to provide here, the better. So if we put thin film lithium out of it here, we can clearly visualize the advantage. So in terms of driving speed, uh, so we know this is a huge improvement even from the bulk lithium out of it. And this is clear from the literature with just a couple of years of development. And it's people already show that over 200 gigabyte can be done on thin film lithium out of it. With, with very high level of encodings. And at the same time, um, I think this access is probably most de debatable. I think our, our, uh, our um, intention here is not to say this is going to be better than silicon, but at least I think it's, it's comparable uh, in a sense that, uh, for example, if you try to make 200 beyond 200 gigabytes uh, transmitters on silicon, um, it's, it's much, much more challenging compared with that doing on thin film lithium orbit. So in that sense, the scalability at those kind of speed for lithium orbit could be comparable or even better uh, for these very high performance devices. So if you consider all of this aspect, thin film lithium orbit really has a multiplicative advantage when considering the all, all possible access of scalability for future, uh, for future devices. Um, so a little bit into the details. Uh, again, this is a different way to visualize this. Really, the, the, the silicon uh, transmitters are, are suffering in voltage and bandwidth, um, but really gains in scalability and thermal resistance and doesn't require thermal electric cooling. Uh, Indian phosphate has much better voltage and bandwidth performance, but is, uh, has, uh, and also smaller size actually, but it's not as scalable as silicon. And for bulk lithium now, um, this is sort of the existing incumbent technology. The voltage is also high. Uh, the thermal resistance are excellent, but it's lacking scalability. So if we look at the same film lithium now bit, we know that we can achieve a low voltage, we can achieve high bandwidth. Uh, the insertion loss can be really, really low because of the intrinsic material property and also the smaller size. Um, but the, uh, the, and also the size, just to give an idea, it's actually pretty comparable to silicon in terms of EO modulation efficiency. Uh, and then the scalability, which accounts for how easy this device can be made at scale, uh, you know, based on our uh, investigation is also excellent. So, um, so, 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 what we want to show you in this chart is that thin film lithium alloy is really strong contender uh, for for next generation optical uh, optical engines. So, what is the difference of the uh, of the lithium alloy or the thin film uh, that we're talking about uh, with the existing lithium alloy approach? So, to, just to keep the discussion at high high level, 
existing lithium orbit employs uh, the bulk substrate and with weakly confined optical mode in this waveguide defined by either proton uh, diffusion or titanium ion diffusion, uh, we're defined as weakly waveguide, weakly uh, guided optical mode with electrodes that are uh, typically separated by tens of microns. So this result in weak modulation efficiency and very long devices. And an approach thin film lithium orbit takes is very similar to silicon on insulated platform. It just instead of silicon on top, you replace that with lithium orbit weight gun. And this weight gun are typically on the order of a micron or less. So it's a very close size to silicon. And the refract index is about 2.2, uh, which is very close to another popular platform, uh, silicon nitride. So with this uh, new platform or with this new approach of doing the, uh, the thin film, um, this is roughly, I think it's roughly scaled to, to, to length, uh, not to thickness. You can see that the thin film lithium orbit module is dramatically shorter than the, uh, than the bulk lithium orbit. Uh, but at the same time, this actually achieves much lower voltage as we demonstrated early on in 2018, that you can reach uh, sub uh, into the one volt range with over 40, 50 gigahertz bandwidth uh, using, using, a thin film, uh, using a thin film approach. Um, and, and remember, this is only the first generation devices that's not a few years after the, uh, the thin film platform was introduced. So right, right now at Hyperlite, uh, so this is after we, uh, we did the internal development, is that the, the second generation, we call the second generation, the CMOS voltage millimeter wave bandwidth electro-optic picks can achieve some really, really amazing numbers. So uh, I think the most relevant wavelengths here is probably 1310 nanometers and 1550 nanometers. And, and we also give, uh, I guess, just a broad reference that we find uh, in the literatures out there that describing silicon modulators. So um, the searching turn, I think, has a natural advantage that it's a shorter wavelength, so less, less phase shift is needed. So therefore, the voltage there is a little bit lower. But you can see that these are significantly lower voltages than, than silicon. And, and, and also, this is the V-pi. This is actually the full swing. Uh, you need to turn it from on or off. So in reality, it depends on what is INDD or coherent modulations, you actually only need a fraction of this voltage. So, so the V-pi of the thin film lithium orbit really puts this into the realm where this could be directly driven uh, by CMOS circuitry. And then not, the amazing thing is at the same time, so this is simultaneously, it is possible to achieve a 3 dB bandwidth over 100 gigahertz with this kind of voltages. Um, now, if you compare with that with silicon, you're looking at a four to six volt at probably low R frequency. And when you go to 40 gigahertz or 60 gigahertz in future system, your, your bandwidth there is, your, or your absolute voltage there is going to be much higher. Um, and then what's even more uh, exciting is that the 60 dB bandwidth, or if you try to see the usable range of the thin film lithium orbit, it's actually beyond 300 gigahertz. And some of our customers has uh, really indeed took this to those frequency ranges. Um, so it, it shows the compatibility for future system if there was ever a need to, to, go, to the, go to those frequencies. And we compare the VPIL, and now we're just comparing with the silicon reverse bias, Maxander broadband Maxander. Uh, the lithium orbit is actually a little bit better. Um, um, but it, so it's, it's very comparable size to silicon. So the size is, uh, of lithium orbit is big, it's, it's also a mystery. Um, the, another really key important here is modulator loss. So because of the intrinsic low insertion loss or low absorption loss of the material, it's possible to get less than one dB for the entire chip system, even with many centimeters of wave that wrapped around. And this is in stark contrast with silicon which for that module is, is typically over 60 dB. And this is also another great factor to, um, uh, for, uh, for, for reducing the optical power for, uh, or the power consumption furthermore. And at the same time, uh, since you now, they, they maintain the regular impedance voltage, so there's something special there. And then the optical extinction is, is also quite good. Um, and of course, to make a, a great photonic platform, uh, you, you need additional components other than just the, the EO modulators. Um, so this is very fortunate because the index is, like I mentioned, is around 2.2. So there's a lot of research in, in silicon or in silicon nitride that this can be easily leveraged to develop. So we very quickly iterated and developed a vast library of, uh, of passive components, also including um, a slow active such as heaters uh, that to complement the functionality of, of, of this platform. So with that sort of in mind, so we made uh, these uh, prototype package devices we work with uh, Nokia Bell Labs as collaborations. And we show that this is actually using the Gen 1 device, not even the Gen 2. 
and we can do a record transmission of 700, gig, 700 gigabits per second over a 10 kilometer optic fiber signal on a single modulator. So this is seven times faster uh, than the uh, than the uh, um, than the uh, than the line rate with transceivers today. But of course, this is a heroic experiment. But it still, nevertheless, shows that there's a lot of room uh, for uh, for future uh, higher speed uh, line rate uh, optical solutions. Um, this can also be used for coherence, uh, just like its uh, its its, its pre predecessor, bulk lithium albate, because of the excellent linearity. And now the particular voltage is going to help a lot at you know when the analog bandwidth goes higher. So here in this case, we went all the way up to 100 gigahertz with 200 gigabyte transmission for co for coherent with with the net data rate of 1.58 terabits per second. Um, so. I think perhaps uh, beyond just modulators, um, there are. If we look a little bit into the future, it, it's not just about uh, it's it's about mo be be better modulators. So there's a lot of uh, subsystems that can be enabled when you have a very low loss system and a very high modulation efficiency system. So for example, some of these devices are just not possible in current platforms. For example. Uh, frequency shifters, which uh, we have demonstrated, it is possible actually to shift, say, 50% of the power of one laser to a particular frequency offset um, uh, with a dedicated uh, uh, amount of power. And it's also possible to do a broadband comb generator by cascading different modulators on the same chip. And you can get, say, a 10 copies of or designated copies of, uh, of, a, of a single tone laser oscillator with very high efficiency, 40 50% overall conversion efficiency. Uh, into a multi-tone uh, uh, oscillator with 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 minimal RF power. So um, this is a great way, I think, for the future system where I think a lot of uh, uh, companies and research institutes are exploring the multi-wavelength oscillator uh, oscillator technologies. And, and that can uh, what sort of it's more interesting here, and maybe even from a practical sense, is that this comb generator can integrate together low loss with low insertion loss with other modulators. And thereby give you the system level advantage. So, so these are uh, these are some of the things that are possible for uh, for some of the future applications. Um, so, so I think there's it's you know hopefully I've, I've convinced you that there is enough motivations to um, um, to explore at least explore this material for uh, for commercial applications. But the uh, perhaps a very important topic uh, that uh, that I want to bring up is the scalability. Uh, because this addressed the other side, right? We show like there's a potential to reduce a large amount of, of, of power consumption, um, but what about the cost? So that's the other side of, uh, of the equation. Um, so of course, this is still in an early stage, so it's, it's not as developed as, as, for example, silicon and phosphate, but there are some fundamental, um, uh, 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 fundamental or first principle a data point that, that we could try to derive what would the cost look like when these are shipped at volume. So, a lithium orbit crystal, they're made the same way as silicon. So they're pulled from a, a, uh, a molten salt of crystals. So, uh, so this is fundamentally a, a, uh, a high, it's a high yield and, uh, and, and low cost process. And then the way the thin film wafers are made are also very similar to silicon insulator. It's through a smart card process. So this process is now actually quite established. Uh, and then this process is also fundamentally uh, not of, uh, of, of, uh, of high cost. And then um, at Hyperlight, uh, we, uh, we, we want to show that this is not just working on single devices. So we made this on, uh, on wafer scale. We're using deep UV lithographies. And then for these ones, um, uh, just to, to, to compare the best achievable uh, loss, we can, get, uh, we can get to less than 0.1 dB per centimeter uh, for both passive and active devices using, uh, using UV uh, lithography. And then uh, maintain a pretty good edge depth variation as well. Uh, just um, even on a without uh, optimized uh, uh, with, 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 without too much optimization. So this just shows like the it's fundamentally the wafers they can be low cost and then these chips can be made at, uh, can be made at at at, at scale. Um, so just another uh, comparison of, of of what we mean by here. So this is not a 200 millimeter or 300 millimeter process like silicon. I think for lithium albate the the more common size is is, is six inches. And, but there are roadmaps toward eight inch as well. So, so here it shows a DUV demo wafer that we did internally 
uh, on a six inch wafer and computing that with the existing above lithium RV modulator. So, it, so you can see that this chip, this chip that's shown here, uh, the V power of this is about uh, two to three volt and then the bandwidth is over hundred gigahertz. So, so this chip with similar or better performance, it's, it's a lot smaller than this and it's probably can bypass this, uh, this power hungry amplifier as well. But you know, again, we understand this technology is, it has been there for, for quite a while, but this is a good reference to show that even with a six inch wafer, you can produce a significant amount of, of, of chips that, that would be interesting to the market and then potentially achieve, uh, achieve a low cost. Um, so with, uh, with all these points of discussion, so uh, I think the, the, you know, I think the, 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 the part that we wanted, we wanted to, um, to communicate with the, with the community is, is our opinion for the commercial deployments or, uh, or the challenges for thinking like lithium photonic integrated circuit. So hopefully we, we have uh, give uh, some evidence for the benefit and also the redness of, of this platform. So lithium Abit, it really offers a very good performance today with a lot of room to improve for, uh, for future demands, especially in terms of optical transmitter functionalities. Um, uh, we, we show that through the sort of a fundamental first principle approach that the cost, uh, it can be cost effective uh, when it shifts its volume. Um, and then there's also evidence that because of the high performance, you can enable some new architectures that are not previously possible. Um, and then finally, there is a path for potential drop-in solutions to have, uh, the, but uh, with the drop-in solution, but still have a system level power improvement for, for present technology challenges. So, so this is something that can be adapted on a relatively short time scale. Um, so of course, as a new uh, new platform, there are, are challenges to be solved. So first one is, is customer adoption and validation does take time. So this is something Hyperlight uh, and with its partners are, 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 um, are working very hard on. Uh, the second question is really integration strategy with additional components. And this needs to be validated as well, for example, photo detectors. Um, so, so this is a part, I think it's, it's, it's worth a lot of discussion is what level of integration and it's probably need to be put into context for different, uh, different applications. And it need to be evaluated on a system level. For example, it, the, you know, it may be more difficult to separate this with detectors, but because it can be, can save driver complexities, that could be an additional advantage. But of course I need to be evaluated uh, all together. And also the resilient and the mature supply chain uh, needs to be established, and then this this is again a community effort, and then uh, it will it may take uh, take a little bit of time. So, so from Hyperlight's perspective, uh, Hyperlight uh, really believes in because of our experience uh, with this material. We really believe this material is providing at least the complementary uh, functionalities for what photonic integrated circuits could offer today. Um, so. So I guess you know, in the, in the um, interest of accelerating this platform, what Hyperlight is offering is today is that we offer uh, custom devices that we could take out actually real devices in, in a relatively short turnaround time, around eight weeks. Uh, we can customize modulators, customize photonic integrated circuits with different functionalities based on our customers' needs. And, and at the same time, uh, we also open to work with customers on standardized, low cost, high volume devices, which may take many months or, or even uh, in, in, in order of years to develop a specification and then a particular customization for certain applications. Um, so, so these are the, uh, the particular effort that Hyperlight is, is, is hoping to, to be able to contribute to the, uh, to the, com uh, to the community. Um, so, so yes, so that is the end of the talk. So if you're interested for samples or collaborations uh, or learn more about our products, please email us uh, at the at the email address below, uh, info at hyperlightcorp.com. Uh, you, you can also reach out to me personally at me and I'm IAN at hyperlightcorp.com. Um, so so and also the image shown here is something that uh, that we are we are interested to explore with the community as well. is It's basically a package version of the Symphony meeting now bit, and, and you can you can get a sense of really the size re reduction and and how does that compare with a uh, with the traditional lithium now bit in, in size and at, 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 the, at the same time this module would run at a at a, at a single volt a uh, uh, single volt but with with over 65 gigahertz bandwidth um, so that is for my talk and uh, and hopefully we can we can spend some time on uh, uh, on, on Q and A's thank you <laughs>